In this video, I'll be introducing subgroups, normal subgroups, and the quotient group. So, first, we say H is a subgroup, H, a subset of G, is a subgroup if. So, we're going to have a couple of conditions. Uh, for all H, H prime, an element of H, when you multiply it, it's fixed. So, take for example, on the real numbers, right, I could take the integers, right? I could also take the rationals, because those are subgroups, right? Because for any of the real numbers under addition here, because for any two integers, an integer plus an integer uh, is an integer. Okay? Uh, and a rational plus a rational is a rational. So those are fixed. But that's not the only condition, is that the identity is an element, which is also true. So z, 0 is an element of z, 0 is an element of q. Okay, and there's also all the even numbers. I just wrote 27. So 2z, all the multiples of 2, all the multiples of 3, all the nth multiples, right? Those are all subgroups of R. And these are all commutative. It's all commutative. You can flip it around. Okay. Um, uh, we say that H is normal if. Okay? So if for all G and element of G, H an element of H, uh, G times H times G inverse, okay, this is also an element of H. It's closed under conjugation everywhere. Okay? Now, what does this mean, for example, in the real numbers? Well, the real numbers, if you don't know, is commutative. So A plus B is B plus A. So if I'm doing a plus b plus a inverse, which is usually denoted minus a, I can just flip it around. Okay, I could write it like that. Right, I could just flip it around. a plus minus a plus b. Then I can, by associativity, I can flip those parentheses. That cancels out to be 0, 0 plus b, but that's just b. Okay. So if B is an element of H, a subgroup, subgroup, right, then conjugation just yields itself, and thus H is normal. Any subgroup of the real numbers is normal, and this is true for any abelian group. So, uh, theorem. Any commutative group commutative group given a given a commutative group given a commutative group any subgroup is normal proof okay um Suppose, suppose H is an element of H. Uh, G times H times G inverse is equal to G times G inverse times H is equal to E times H is equal to H is an element of H. QED. Okay, we're done. Okay, cool. So, now, what can we do with this fact? Well, you may think about something called a coset. Coset. I've already denoted it. 2z. 
right? Two, all multiples of two. Okay, so two, negative two, um, sorry, zero, two, negative two, four, negative four. Which is really the set of two times n for n an element of z. Okay, so let's define this similarly. G times uh, GH, I'll write it, is equal to the set of all G times H for H and H. Okay, this is called a left coset. A left coset. Okay, so GH is a left coset and it's the set of all multiples of H in H. Okay, so what? How about we just define a multiplication? Uh, G H times I'll denote it star star G prime H is just G times G prime H, right? We can define that multiplication, but there's a problem. Note that H is a subgroup, right? And that means that H times H prime or h times h, this coset, right, h times h, just h, right? Because this is just going to be the set of all h times h prime, which is going to be the set of all h times h prime for h prime an element of h, right? And now what I need to do is show that this ex and now I say that I can uh, I can create any um, any element of H from this. Okay, so what I do is I do H times H prime, and I want that to equal H double prime. Okay, then what I do is I say H prime equals H double prime times H inverse. Okay, because oh, sorry on the left h inverse times h double prime, right? Because then, if I multiply it by that, I'll get it. And this is still an element of h, element of h. So, therefore, h times h for h and h is h. <laughs> uh, for h in h, right? So, what if I chose, instead of doing g, this is going to be the same thing as GH times H, or GH, H, right? G times H, H, right? If I choose an element of it, I'm going to have it there. And I know that if I multiply this by G inverse, but I can multiply that by the same H, G inverse times H, yeah, right? I should get the identity, which is just H. Okay? So what I'm saying here is that GH uh, star G inverse H is equal to G times G inverse H, which is just H. And now what I'm doing is I'm re-electing a representative that yield the same exact thing. Because if I'm just multiplying this by an element of H, I'm still going to get g times h out of it. Okay? So, now, what I can do is I can combine these two using the definition. I get g times h times g inverse times h, h, right? Or in other words, that's just going to be g times g times h times g inverse h, because that h doesn't matter. And, how do I know that this is going to be an element of H, right? That's the only way I'm going to get H, is if it's an element of H. Well, if it's normal, if it's normal, that's exactly the condition. So, um, H must be normal for this to work. It's to work. Okay. Okay, so for this multiplication to be well defined, H must be normal. Okay. 
So, what we've determined so far, I'm going to do a little overview, because it might have been a little complicated. Okay? H is normal. If G times H times G inverse is just H. It's closed under conjugation. Okay? G, H, G inverse is equal to H. Which is equivalent to just saying that uh, for all H in H, G times H times G inverse is in H. Okay? That's the requirement. Cool. Now, next thing is that what we did right there was define the quotient group, G mod H. It's usually written like this. And this is the set of all cosets. It's the set of all G, H for G and G. For H normal. And the reason why we have H normal is so that this is a group. So G mod H star. Okay? And we define the star as G H star G prime H is G times G prime H. Okay? This is what we're doing. We're just saying, if I'm multiplying two of these together, I'm just multiplying each of these. Each of the representatives I picked. And the reason why I'm doing that is so that this is well defined. I can pick any representative I want, and I'll still get uh, a good, the same answer. So, now, what's the use of looking at this normal subgroup? That's what we're going to look at in the next video.